Welcome to the Cloud Native Build Packs Intro Talk. Today we're going to be talking about the Cloud Native Build Pack project, which is currently in the CNCF sandbox. We're going to be talking about the tooling this project provides and how it can help you turn your application into a container image. Uh, I'm Emily Casey. I'm an engineer at Pivotal, and I work on the Cloud Native Build Packs contributor team at Pivotal. I'm also a maintainer of the platform and implementation sub teams of the project. Hi, I'm Terrence Lee. Uh, I work at Heroku as an engineer. Uh, I helped create the original Build Packs API and one of the founding members of the Cloud Name Build Packs project, uh, along with some of these other fine folks in the front of the room. Um, so, with Kubernetes, we have a great way to orchestrate and run images, but you actually need images to start with to actually run it in a kube cluster. And Cloud and Build Packs provide um, a great way to take your application and turn it into a Docker OCI image that you can run in your cluster, uh, and it maps layers logically to layers that make sense in your application itself uh, with relatively zero configuration of like Cloud Native Build Pack specific configuration that you have to do to actually make that application work. Um, and it's actually built on top of this uh, kind of older build packs thing that was invented in 2011 by Heroku. And so we've been running um, kind of the ideas that kind of made cloud native build packs uh, that it is today, uh, which started in 2018, um, from concepts that we've been doing in production between both Heroku and Pivotal over the last seven or eight years. And we wanted to kind of bring all those great ideologies uh, to this container ecosystem um, and bring kind of some of those methodologies um, there. And so, at the end, when you actually build an image, uh, you get this image that allows you to have these reproducible builds that allow you to kind of inspect these images without un unpacking the image itself um, and create uh, images that have like these uh, logical um, layer mappings. And so as a project, there's kind of a few important parts to the Cloud Native Build Packs project. Uh, there's um, at its core, the specification itself, and uh, we like to call lifecycle kind of the implementation of the spec. And so there's kind of two different um, contracts that are there. There's the build pack API, which is the part where Lifecycle will actually go ahead and run the build packs and execute them to actually produce that image, as well as uh, the platform API. So a platform can uh, basically take the Lifecycle and run uh, the resulting images and kind of launch uh, the resulting uh, processes and stuff and set the environment and things like that. And so. Um, the platform that we provide uh, out of the project is this project called PAC, which is geared towards local development. And it's kind of our reference implementation of what a platform could look like um, geared towards local development with like a local Docker daemon. And so this is a high level diagram that shows uh, kind of taking a source image or taking source, uh, running it through PAC and kind of getting this res resulting image. And Emily's gonna run through a demo uh, that kind of walks through what that looks like and you'll have a much better understanding of what that diagram looks like. All right, so let's dive right in. I have a sample node application here and I have the pack CLI installed. I'm gonna run pack build. I'm gonna provide it with a tag in a registry where I can export this app. I'm gonna provide the publish flag which tells pack to export the image directly into the registry, which is the most performant way to run pack. So let's give this a go. So what pack is doing here is taking the life cycle and running it in a series of Docker containers in my local Docker daemon. In a minute, we're gonna dive into the details of what is specifically happening in each of these life cycle steps. You can see the headings for the different life cycle phases. But zooming out at a really high level, what we've done here is selected a group of build packs to run during this lifecycle phase called detection. So here we have the node engine build pack and the yarn build pack uh, and their versions. You might notice that this version is called old, which is something we're going to come back to and update later. If you're clever, you might have guessed that. Now in the building phase, each of these build packs executes and it contributes dependencies that will end up at the final image. So the node engine build pack is contributing Node.js. Uh, the yarn build pack is contributing modules. Uh, they are writing these dependencies to specific locations in the file system. 
And at the end here, the exporter is wrapping all of this up to create an image. So now that I've built this image, I can use pack to learn a little bit more about my image. So let's use this pack inspect image command. And we can see some info here. So we see what build packs were used to create the image. Um, the dependency and app layers are added on top of what we call a run image, which provides the operating system and those dependencies. And we can see information about the tag where we found the run image and the specific run image we use at build time. Finally, if we provide the build materials flag to this command, we can see more details about the specific dependencies that were installed into this image. So for example, we can see that we installed node 10.16.3. Uh, we can see the URI it originally came from and the licenses associated with it, stuff like that. So zooming back out, now we can look at this diagram of what's going on in PAC and understand it a little more deeply. Um, when PAC executed those lifecycle steps, the containers it ran in were created from an image called a builder image. And the builder image is a packaging of a set of build packs and a lifecycle they're compatible with. So PAC adds the source code to containers created from the builder image, runs the lifecycle phases, and in the end you get an app image that starts with a run image, which it comes from our stack layer, which represents the operating system and its packages, with semantically meaningful layers, one for each dependency, and the application layer and the modifications the build pack might have made to your application on top. So diving a little bit into what happens in each lifecycle step. Uh, during the detect phase, the lifecycle executes the detect binary in each build pack. And what happens during the detect phase is the build pack looks at the application source and determines whether and how it should run. So for example, if I have a package JSON and a yarn lock file, the node build pack is going to say, yes, I can build this app, and the yarn build pack will too, and together they'll make a build pack group that will execute at build time. In a case where, for example, we didn't have a yarn lock file, we might get the node and NPM build packs collaborating to build the application. So detection happens in parallel um, in order to be performant, but we still want to allow the build packs to collaborate with each other because one build pack might need a dependency from an upstream build pack in order to execute its piece of the build. So this is facilitated with a concept called the build plan. So as the build packs detect, they can write into the build plan dependencies that they either provide or require. So after detection has run on all of the build packs, the detector looks at the output to find a build plan where all the provides match requires, and that's the first group where that is true is the group that's selected, and those build packs will run. On this first build, we're going to skip over restore and analyze because they become important for efficiency on the rebuild step. So we're going to move ahead to the build phase of the life cycle. Uh, when the lifecycle executes build, the lifecycle builder will call the build binary on each build pack. And this is really like the meat of the build and what most people think about when they think about build packs. So the build packs will run, they'll look at the source code, and they will provide dependencies like Node.js or Yarn or Node modules in layers. Um, right now, they're directories on the file system. So once we have those directories on the file system, uh, we can turn each of those directories into a layer. Uh, and so the export phase basically converts all that stuff into the resulting image that you can run uh, at the end of it. And so uh, once we've done export, you actually have a runnable image that you could Docker run, you can run your kube cluster, and what have you. Um, and finally, there's the caching phase. And so this is what we're, this is done to basically take anything that a build pack author might deem uh, that can be used to basically save steps or processing time in a future build or a subsequent build. Um, so an example of this might be like the node modules. Uh, um, once we have that, you don't have to fresh install it every time. So kind of taking a different view and slice of what this looks like, um, if we look at what the Docker image layers could look like uh, here um, on the right-hand side, so in the export phase, we're going to 
uh, in the bill pack that Emily showed off, we have um, that node modules directory of all the kind of the uh, node library dependencies that are included in there. Um, there's node engine, which represents the runtime itself, like the version of node you're gonna run, uh, and that was like 10.16.3 in that example. Uh, the application specific code, so uh, this lives in the workspace directory, but basically the source code and any mutations that they'll pack needs to do uh, on that um, directory to make the app runnable. Um, as well as the stack image, and then any of the layer and build configuration uh, sits in a layer, and those make up kind of the OCI image that gets run. Um, and then in addition to that, um, we have these cache layers which can be um, used and kept separate from the actual exported image. So as build pack author, you can have, say, like the NPM cache uh, live in this cache layer because you don't actually need it to boot or run your application. So we have this separate, um, set of things that we want to cache that we uh, may or may not want in the final exported image. And so with that, we'll look at a rebuild uh, on this exact same app as we make changes. So let's come back to our app. And we pointed out that we installed node 10.16.3. So let's say I want to update the minor version of node. When I first ran this pack build, I didn't supply a builder because I have a default builder set on the system. But let's take a look at the default builder that we're using. So we can use the pack inspect builder command to look at all the build packs on this builder and the order they detect in. We can see this old version of the node engine build pack. So I have an updated builder here that we can look at. And it's almost exactly the same, but it has the new version of the build pack. So let's say I want to rebuild with this new builder. I can add the builder flag here and supply the name of this builder image. Now, generally, you wouldn't necessarily update your builders by pointing at a different tag. You'd be pointing at one builder tag that a group like Cloud Foundry or Heroku would constantly be publishing build pack updates to, but we're gonna do it like this for the sake of the demo. And we can see on rebuild that our new node engine build pack has detected. Uh, we're restoring cache layers and metadata. We're gonna describe a little bit more about what's going on there in a second. Um, and during the build phase, the node engine build pack sees that the layer is out of date compared to what it wants the version of this dependency to be. So we'll install the newer version of node. Uh, the yarn build pack can actually go ahead and just reuse the cache layer because this version of node is ABI compatible with the previous version. Um, when we come down into the exporting phase, we can see that only one new layer uh, with an actual dependency in it had to be added and uploaded here. Uh, the config layer gets regenerated every time. So we can pack inspect our image here and look at the dependencies and we can see that we, by just pointing at a newer builder, we're able to get updates to our dependencies. So let's dive into a little bit of detail what was happening in each of those lifecycle containers. Detect, same as last time. During restore, uh, layers that we put into the cache were returned to the file system in order to help build packs build more quickly, either because they need those dependencies at build time or because it's easier to make a small change to the cache layer than to regenerate it from scratch. During analyze, the analyzer looks at the actual OCI image that was generated last time and writes metadata about the layers to the file system. So an example of this might be like a node toml file describing the version of node that was in the previous image. And it will include metadata like the version that was in that layer. Uh, the reason we do this is so that build packs can use this information to decide whether they want to bother regenerating a layer or not. So if a build pack says, uh, you know, this version is the version I want, and this is a exported layer, they can just leave that file and do nothing, and the layer will be reused from the previous image. Finally, the build phase executes, like we saw in the first build, except that now the build packs can use the metadata 
to only rebuild layers that they want to change, and you, they can use the cache to speed up that build. So what's different this time with export is that we actually only have to export or um, update uh, layers that have actually changed. So anything that hasn't changed, so like the no models directory from before, doesn't actually need to be repushed to the registry because uh, it, we're reusing that existing layer from um, uh, the registry itself. So uh, we can simply speed up uh, kind of the export of the stuff that we actually need to do. Um, and then similarly with caching, uh, there's a check shawsome of each of the different uh, caching layers that we want to use. And so uh, in this case, uh, we only need to update the node engine cache uh, layer because that's the only one that's actually being updated. We didn't even actually run a yarn install to actually update those dependencies because we're just reusing that layer. Um, so going through kind of the layer breakdown example again as we go through it. So Emily was talking about restore. So we're actually going to go ahead and restore those images uh, or those caching layers if possible, um, if they're available, and make those available to the build. Um, with analysis, we're going to go ahead and read that configuration so that node toml file Emily was talking about uh, and provide that so the build pack can make intelligent decisions during the build process of whether it needs to recalculate those layers. Um, and then once we've actually set up uh, and done the build parts that we need to do, we can export. And in this case, uh, for example, we've run through, we're just updating the configuration and the node engine because in the yarn build pack, we're not actually uh, running yarn install, we're just reusing that layer. Um, and then with caching, there is a similar optimization where um, since we're not actually changing any other cache layers, uh, we're only going to be updating the node engine one for the cache so it can be used in, uh, an updated version of it in the future builds that we're doing. So that's kind of what it looks like to just do like development where you're just building images and running them. But uh, once you're actually doing that, you're probably going to be putting this in production and running it. And so one of the easiest ways to illustrate uh, some of the day two or kind of production operations you're going to do would be like patching this Node.js application in case there is an operating system level CV that you have to handle. Um, and so SNCC uh, released an article uh, this year about, you know, like the top 30 Docker images has all these vulnerabilities um, in them. And actually, uh, you can actually just swap out kind of the underlying base image that we've been talking about uh, to actually mitigate uh, a good chunk of uh, those CVEs. So just updating your, keeping your operating system up to date actually handles a good amount of the vulnerabilities that people have been finding in these very popular Docker images. And so Emily's going to walk through what that looks like uh, with Cloud and Build Packs using Pack. All right. So let's come back to look at our image here. So the operating system and the operating system packages are in what we call the base layers, which come from this base image here. Um, we can see that we originally looked at this one of these run images tags to find a run image to build on top of. Um, the tool will select the run image that's on the registry you're exporting to for maximum efficiency. And then this base image includes the specific image that we built on top of at run time, like the image digest. So I actually have an updated version of this run image here. And I'm gonna push it up to my registry. And now we can rebase this application and it should replace the base layers on this image with the new base layers we pushed to the registry. So I meant to do with the publish flag, hold on. Okay, you can see it's much faster when you're operating directly against the registry. So now that we've rebased this image, we can take a look and I don't know if you remember the Shaw from last time, you probably don't, but the base layers have changed. Um, and I'm realizing we forgot to show that this image actually runs last time, so now that we've made a couple changes to it, let's actually pull it down and run it. Not that one. Okay, this guy. I'm just giving it a little environment variable so it knows what port to run on. So let's give this a go. So you probably have a existing running thing on the uh, port, so you can stop it. 
or just give it a new Let's port. just do it on a different port here for a second. Sorry, guys, I didn't clean up from practice. There we go. So let's come over here. And this application is very interesting. I just grabbed a Cloud Foundry sample application, but you can see that uh, just by running pack build, we were able to generate an image that we can run. And these updates have allowed us to keep a working image. So let's talk about what is happening during rebase. Um, in an image, normally you have uh, OS layers and language runtime layers and application layers on top of that. So we maintain a logical separation between the application layers and the operating system layers and operating system packages. So imagine there's a CVE in the operating system. We can upload to the registry a new image that contains a patched operating system. Um, and these two images have a guarantee between them called ABI compatibility. So application binary interface compatibility. And what that means is all of these layers, these application layers that we've built, uh, can run exactly as they are on top of the new base layers. And this, because we're building on top of Ubuntu Bionic, this is a guarantee provided to us by Canonical. So what we can do is create a new image directly against the registry, not by rebuilding or re-uploading anything other than a config file that describes an image that combines these base layers with the application layers and a manifest file for that image. So that's a great example of like doing it for a single app, but I mean, if you're rolling this out in production, you're probably not doing it for a single application. You're probably gonna be doing it at scale uh, with a cluster of applications out there. And so potentially if you run to a thing where there is a CV that you have to apply, you have to actually deal with that for every single application in your fleet. Um, and that means that you have to figure out some mitigation strategy for running this with Docker uh, to figure out like how that actually works, right? So um, if you're doing this with Dockerfile traditionally, um, that means for every different base image, you have to actually figure out a strategy for actually mitigating that. Uh, for each different base image you're doing. And then in the best case scenario where it's all the same, uh, you still have to do a rebuild across the entire fleet for every type of application you're running, um, which um, if you have a small fleet, that maybe that's a few hours, a few days to just even do the rebuild before you actually roll it out. Um, in the worst case, if it doesn't rebuild cleaning, you have to find engineering time to actually go ahead and fix uh, your application uh, to account for the new changes uh, uh, with those patches. Um, and so we're gonna take a look at what that looks like um, doing that with um, KPAC um, with Cloud Native Build Packs. So we talked about how by uh, implementing the platform API, any platform can take advantage of the core functionality of the lifecycle and the Cloud Native Build Packs um, building technology. So we talked about one platform, which was PAC, and PAC provides a UX that's optimized for a developer workstation. It's a local CLI, it has an imperative flow. Now we're gonna talk about KPAC, which is a pivotal open source project that uses a set of custom Kubernetes resources and controllers uh, to manage many images and it provides a declarative API. Um, and it's well suited to rebuilding many images with cloud native build packs at scale. So, it's the same core building technology, but wrapped in a UX that's optimized for a different use case. So let's take a minute and look at an architectural overview of KPAC. Um, these boxes highlighted in teal are custom resources in KPAC. Um, at the heart of KPAC is the image resource. So in the image resource, you can declaratively describe the image you want to see living at a particular tag in the container registry. So you can say, I want source from this branch on my Git repo, and I want it to be built with a specific builder. And then every time that the reality falls out of date with the desired configuration, either because a build pack gets updated or the source changes, uh, KPAC will schedule a build. So an image is a mutable config, and Every time that the system reconciles, it makes an immutable build. So a builds map 
one-to-one -to, -one to digest in the image registry, and this image describes the desired state at a mutable tag. So let's go ahead and take a look at. Gus, question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> to the right of this diagram. The spitting out build images, some of which happen just because there's a CVE patch, and those ones we'd like just roll out automatically, like we do a Cloud Foundry and Heroku effectively, if we replace them. Mm -hmm. The others are app changes, and we don't want to roll those out automatically to production. What, what, what goes to the right of this, this page? Repeat the question. So I'm going to repeat the question for the recording. The question is, what goes to the right of this page? So this system is generating builds, and that's great and all, but like, what is responsible for knowing what to do with certain builds, and also, like, do I want to do something different because it was built for a different reason, like a rebase? Um, we sort of think of that as outside of the <coughs> scope of the Cloud and Build Packs project, but there definitely are people building tools that use things like this as a building block in the process of creating a higher level abstraction. Like uh, the Riff team, for example, like uses KPAC as a component in their function service. So they plug this set of CRDs in and you generate a bunch of images and then a larger set of CRDs that describe higher level concepts like a function or an application take care of deploying those. Um, but if you want to so do so some... The long term answer to this out of scope, like build pack will never take responsibility for saying the CV patch image gets blessings if we get off the production. You know, I think the build packs take responsibility for providing all of the information that a platform we need in order to make those determinations, right? So like either creating a derivative image config, so I want to rebase this one particular image that I've deployed to prod, not just what's on master, uh, stuff like that. Yeah, sorry for the pursuit questions. All the yeah. metadata in the build, does that tell, like if someone was watching the build, would it know that what was changed was from the build up versus from an app? Yeah. The build resources are uh, annotated with the reason for the build. Yeah. I'm good now, thanks. No problem. You're making us jump ahead here. <laughs> We're going to get to other platforms later. All right, sorry. Let's rebase multiple images. So I have KPAC installed here. Um, I've taken the liberty of installing a builder image here. So I created a configuration that points at a tag and KPAC has populated it with the build packs it found on this image and that builder image has a reference to a run image tag and we can also see the particular digest reference of the run image at that tag. Um, I've also created a couple images here, demo apps one through three. They're simple Java apps. And we're gonna see what it would look like to rebase all of your images. Right now it's only three, but this could easily, on a large cluster scale, to many images being managed this way. So let's, first of all, let's talk about how these images got built because I think that's interesting. Uh, if we go over here, where I have this logs utility, we can look at the original build that was used to create the first version of this image. And this should look very familiar because this is almost exactly the output you're getting from the PAC CLI. Uh, KPAC ran the same lifecycle in a series of containers in a pod in Kubernetes, but the like, Core technology here being used is the same. This is a Java app, not like the Node app that we built originally. Um, so now that we have this app, because it's being built with the same lifecycle, it's annotated with the same metadata. So we can inspect this image and see the Java build packs that contributed to this build 
and the specific run image that we have here. So like last time, I actually have an updated version of this run image that I'm now going to push up to the registry. <coughs> so because KPAC is watching the image at the builder tag, and that includes a run image tag, um, it should see that this run image, the digest of this tag has changed, um, and it will update the builder for us. It's going to take a couple seconds. So we're just going to watch it while it goes. There it goes. All right. So now that this run image has changed, KPAC knows that all these images need to be rebased in order to match their desired config. So if we get the builds, before we ran this, we only had one build for each app, but now we have extra builds. These are rebases. We can see, I know Nick was interested in seeing the reason for the builds. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I'm gonna show you. Uh, hold on. I cannot typo it. All right, so we can see the reason for this build was type stack, meaning that it's a rebase. Um, and if we inspect the image, we can see that we have updated the run image. And simply by pushing this one run image, it's able to get a rebase of all of the appropriate images on my cluster. Um, and we showed this example for a stack, but this would work with a build pack update as well. Thanks, Emily. So I guess I'm kind of just recapping a little bit. We, we were talking about the context before, I guess, um, the demo slash next questions. Um, and, you know, like, we're talking about, like, how long it would actually take to mitigate this at scale uh, if you're using, like, Docker files in production. And uh, Emily kind of showcased, like, doing that rebase, like, it, for her, it only took a few minutes, but you can imagine maybe it takes a little bit longer if you have a bunch of different builds you have to do um, across the entire fleet. Um, and so this is a thing that scales relatively well um, and actually can be done relatively quickly, um, especially in comparison to what you'd have to do with a rebuild per app. Um, so this is rebasing with KPAC. Um, so just you know another platform that is uh, leveraging uh, cloud and build packs with a totally different UX uh, like we were talking about. And so really at the end of the day, uh, uh, cloud and build packs are um, kind of alluding to some of Dr. Nick's questions, uh, like building blocks uh, where different platforms or uh, services that want to take advantage of it can have different UX and parameters of what they want to do, but it's just providing the primitives to actually do image building uh, for things like applications. And so uh, both Cloud Foundry and Heroku are actively working on various cloud and build packs. Um, uh, to kind of take advantage of some of this stuff. Uh, with the Google Cloud Run project, um, they have uh, a thing where you can click a button with Google Cloud Run and it will actually build an app using build packs uh, or Docker files. Um, project Riff is a, I guess, like function, uh, s functions as a service uh, that basically uses cloud native build packs as building blocks to kind of provide this, like, higher level abstraction for building functions. Um, so at the end, you still do get this OCI image that you can run, um, but it's using uh, their own set of CMBs underneath to actually make that happen. Um, so build packs are being used kind of as a foundational piece to actually provide this kind of image building service across uh, a bunch of different platforms. And hopefully through the demos and this presentation, uh, you're able to see that um, Build packs have a lot of pretty great uh, properties uh, surrounding them. So when we talk about reusable, uh, one of the things that was nice in the KPAC demo is that like there was this same unified build pipeline of the lifecycle, and you're using like a very small subset of build packs. Whereas if you ever deploy Dockerfile in production at your company, you probably have this kind of sprawling snowflakes of Docker files per app. So you're checking in a Docker file per repo, and in all the demo apps and apps that people are using build packs on, uh, you're not checking in the actual build pack into your app. Like it is a kind of separate thing that can be reused across multiple applications. Um, through the use of, of 
basically the build configuration, uh, the caching. Uh, we, can base, we can choose what we need to actually do work for rebuilding um, for both the image itself as well as pushing to the registry. So um, things that uh, can be fast should be fast. Um, you saw through the node example that we're using multiple kind of smaller modular build packs that compose like this node build pack. So it means that um, if you need to replace a certain component, like maybe you want to, I, like a few years ago when IOGS was a thing and potentially the platform you were working on doesn't support it, you could write your own like IOGS engine build pack to sub that in. Or I guess a more realis realistic example is like if you're working with Java and you need to replace the runtime, you could replace like the JDK or JRE like build pack that's installing that and say you're on AWS, you want to use the kind of Amazon's proprietary uh, JDK in that case, right? And so you could just write a build pack that leverages the rest of those components but just replaces that one piece. Um, and then finally, uh, they're kind of secure out of the gate uh, with these authors who are actually maintaining and patching this stuff. Um, with the metadata that's provided, you don't actually have to unpack the Docker image itself to kind of look at it for compliance or other reasons there. Um, and then with features like Rebase, you can actually roll out day zero patches relatively uh, quickly. And so uh, you should check it out. Uh, go to the BuildPacks.io website. Um, you can go and download. Basically, the easiest way to get started is through the pack um, CLI that we've demoed throughout this presentation, uh, the latest version is 0.5. Uh, most people don't have to go ahead and like, just write a build pack to get started. Uh, as part of the builders that are kind of suggested in the pack CLI, you can use the Heroku and Cloud Foundry builders that support probably most of the languages you'll be work you care or work with uh, today. Um, if you just go to the BuildPacks.io site, uh, you can check out documentation for getting started, can kind of walk through a lot of the stuff that we've talked about uh, in this presentation. Um, we're pretty active on Slack, uh, working with various contributors. If you want to get involved or have questions, um, fairly active on there. There's a mailing list. And then uh, we also have a deep dive talk being done by uh, Steven and Joe tomorrow uh, at 520, where they're going to kind of dig into uh, production build packs and kind of how they work. And, you can get a better feel of like what it takes to actually kind of write this stuff in production. Cool. Thanks. Um, so <laughs> looks like we have like seven minutes. So do people have someone have questions? Um, if you do, please come step up on the mic so it can get recorded for the uh, video. Uh, this is a relatively quick one. Um, some of this seems to overlap, at least conceptually, with the cloud native application bundle spec. Do you know if anybody's working on combining this with that, or do they conflict with each other, or do they complement each other, or like, are they totally unaware of each other right now? Uh, we're aware of the cloud native uh, CNAB um, project. Um, I don't think we're doing anything that conflicts with it. Uh, we're not really doing anything that also makes us like make a CNAB out of it. So like you can't do a pack build and get a CNAB out of that project. But um, uh, I think CNAB has a significantly bigger scope as far as like packaging concerns, um, right? Because it talks about both like what you're installing locally on your machine and how it like, it's a pretty generic, it has, it's a huge specification with a pretty generic uh, scope of like what it can contain. And um, I think the, the build package project is much more concerned around um, deploying like services and applications and kind of those use cases to production. Hi, could you explain how this might integrate with your CI CD um, server? Do you just run pack commands in there or how do you run it? So you can, as like a simple first pass, start by running pack in a CI CD server. But the more optimal way to do it is to integrate the lifecycle directly with some of these CI CD tools. So one example is we provide like a template in the Tekton catalog. Tekton is like an example CI CD tool and it will just execute the lifecycle directly in a series of containers. So the Tekton tool itself is doing the orchestration and that's nice because you don't have the problem of like running Docker in Docker like you would if you use the PAC CLI. So directly integrating the lifecycle is better where it's possible. Yeah. That being said, it's pretty easy to, I think, like leverage and run it on like a Circle or Travis or some of the well-known third-party CI sort of yeah. full-on services. 
Hey, it seems like the process would be if I'm a developer that I'm still coding locally on everything then using PAC or KPAC to deploy it out to my cluster. Have you all looked at integrating with some of the other tools, not integrating, but taking the same approach as well for like local development? So things like Octeto and, and Telepresence, things that can sync changes over to a running container, is that completely out of scope of what you're trying to do with PACs? Does that make sense what I'm asking? So you're talking about sort of like as you're developing it, syncing and updating on the fly? Yeah. It's definitely something we've talked about. Um, I don't think we have a proposal. I mean, you could, if the delays suggest, like, is it, if you were gonna hack the container, you just <coughs> replace those la layers, but I don't know, how do you restart the process as you make? I should ask the process as yeah. well as you deal with updates. Yeah, we, uh, so we've talked about, like in the spec, there's actually a bin develop thing uh, that we've talked about. It's not uh, implemented yet, um, and there's probably still much more work to be done on it. So I don't think we have anything that does exactly what you're talking about, but it's definitely something that is not out of scope. Uh, it's just uh, a lot of the focuses uh, today, since we're still in beta, has been on kind of production use cases and productionization. Um, so getting like production level images and running them and, and having good process for maintaining those things. Um, but we're definitely interested in both like better story around testing and development um, as well. Oh, going, back to the CI, going back to the CI CD question, uh, does the life cycle also include uh, like uh, QA automation scenarios and all that? Or is life cycle only just packing and exporting the image out? Can you repeat the question? Uh, what so type of automation? From the CI CD perspective, uh, one of the, sp like, in CI CD, these are called pipelines, right? You, were, yeah. you have the build stage, you have like an automation test stage, uh, acceptance test, or, or whatever. So that, is that incorporated into lifecycle? That's what my question is. No. Okay. So like how, like one example of how you might fit it into a pipeline is, say you have source code, you might want to run your unit test first, and then you use the lifecycle to build an image, and then yeah. that, image becomes your immutable artifact, and then you can deploy it and like run acceptance tests against that, and then yeah. that artifact is what moves down the pipeline. Pipeline, yes. But I don't think we're thinking about, in the near future, about running tests as part of the life cycle. So how do I uh, distribute, how do we distribute builders and build packs within the organization? How do I make sure that Everyone, what's the distribution mechanism to make sure people in my organization don't have an older version, the wrong version or an older version of the build pack? So if you have, if we're talking about a builder image and you have this image on a registry, uh, all the tools we've demoed today will always try to pull the newest version from the registry before running. So it does that by default. Um, you can also distribute build packs um, in what we call a build package is our new, specification for distributing them, and that all works by the same mechanism. It's like packaging build packs in an OCI image, and we try to always pull when something is available. But it checks for new ones in each run, so you never have to worry. Yeah. yeah. I noticed that your version is beta. How mature is this project for usage? Is it production ready? Is it? Uh, I mean, yeah, so we're, we're getting to a point where um, stuff is, for the most part, not backwards breaking. I think we just made a significant backwards breaking thing uh, relatively recently, but uh, for the most part, um, a lot of the stuff going forward, we're not doing a lot of breaking changes, and for the most part, any of the kind of breaking changes would fall on the kind of build, they have tend to fall on like the build pack API side. Uh, so like, I guess for production level usage, it, um, it kind of depends on like the, like if you're using the Heroku and Cloud Foundry build packs, uh, you know, like they've been used for a while, um, depending on which build packs you're using. Um, and but if you're like writing your own, I think it's much more dependent on like uh, whether the build packs you're writing you feel are also production ready in that sense. Um, as far as lifecycle and other things, like we definitely have use cases where people are using it in production and people are leveraging it. So uh, yes, like we've had to make some breaking changes, but we've also are conscious about those things and we do versioning and are cognizant of like not wanting to actually break uh, users that are running it now. And also if you're using a maintained platform that can encapsulate you from the breaking changes. So we might make a breaking change to one of those APIs right now at this stage in beta, but the platform is capable of knowing which 
API it's running against and doing the right thing. So for most use cases, you wouldn't even feel many of the breaking changes. It mostly falls on like platform authors. And if I wrote a, if I write custom build packs, the APIs that they rely on might change in future versions. Yeah. Maybe. Well, so like one of the things we provide is uh, a library called uh, libbuildpack uh, for Go. Um, and for the for most like kind of breaking style things, we will deprecate stuff. Um, and so you. Um, the library itself will continue to work for the most part on like the next release and then kind of give you that time to update your build pack to kind of take into account uh, those changes. Um, if there's, there's I think only been one time where we haven't done that because it was really like hard to actually maintain both of those things um, at one time. But um, oftentimes we'll like, if we deprecate an MVAR for like a new one, like uh, the lib build pack will just account to do both of those things, so you don't really have to kind of make those changes. Thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, question on um, what accounts for the security modules like AppArmor or SecCom in the build process, or is that a responsibility of whoever provides the container image? I think that's, that's definitely something that is uh, taking account by who's providing the kind of container image. So, like, when you're providing the stack or kind of base or run images, like, uh, like the build packs themselves are not uh, out of the box and provide, like, a app security thing out of the gate as part of the project. Um, but, uh, yeah, like, the container image should have, I guess, like, those rules and stuff in place. Sorry, hi. Uh, you said that your base images are based on Ubuntu. Do you update these images? So in the example we were running, the base image was based on Ubuntu. Um, the project itself doesn't provide maintained stacks, but both uh, Cloud Foundry and Heroku do provide maintained stacks that like push updated base images within a certain window after every CVE notification. Yeah, and those are kept up to date because we maintain them for our own customers independent of kind of the Cloud Native Build Packs project. But they're free to use. Yeah. <laughs> All right, it looks like that's it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You.